Hi, Chuck Brewer, Director of Operations for Concrete Technologies. If you're watching this video, it's because you've already been to one of our CTI training schools and are now a CTI dealer. And more than likely got 10, 20, 30, 40, some of you even $50,000 worth of product sitting in your garage or in a warehouse. And I'm sure you're wondering, where do I go? What do I do with it? Well, today I'm going to take you out in the field and I'm going to show you what to do from start to finish to get that product off your floor and put money back in your bank account. Some of the things that you run into in the field, unlike what you're going to run into in a controlled environment, is vegetation, grass, trees, bushes, all of which that are on this job that we're going to show you what to do and how to handle. Starting off with, if you look at the side of the driveway here, where it comes up, in certain places the grass is much higher than the actual concrete. I mean, in this case, we're talking about the grass being three to four inches above the slab. What we're going to have to do is trim this grass back so we can actually get to the edge of the concrete. We're going to follow that all the way up. Now, once you get up here, you notice that it's perfect. We have great access to the side of the concrete for rounding the edges and cleaning this up. On both sides, you might need to edge the grass back or even use a weed eater, which we're going to use on the other side of the driveway today, to clean some of the grass down so you can actually get to the work area that you're going to be working on. Another thing you may encounter is landscaping. Sometimes the foliage or the landscaping overhangs the work area. You want to do minimal impact on the landscaping, so we want to tie back and protect as much of it as possible. In some cases, it is going to be necessary to actually break out the hedge trimmers or the shears and trim back the bushes and trees. Take that around, Ryan. All the way up underneath. And pull it back as high as we can. Okay, go get me that first wrap. If you notice, the tape that we're using is actually our three quarter inch filament tape. Um, it's strong enough, as you know, you've got to cut it with a razor blade. You can't break it with your hand, so it is going to hold back the foliage. You can put a lot of pressure on it. You can also tie it in a knot on the back side. That way, when you're done with your job and you're finished sealing, everything looks great, you can cut the cords and basically all the foliage swings back into place and it looks like you were never there. Voila. Now that we've tied the bush up, I'm going to clean out some of this undergrowth and it'll give us access to the edge of the concrete. Although we're not in the landscaping business, we're in the decorative concrete business, at times you are going to be required to do some landscaping. Um, tying back bushes, trimming, weed eating, edging. I made it standard practice just to make sure I've got a weed eater and an edger in my trailer at all times because you can't always depend on the homeowner to do the necessary things that need to be done prior to you getting there to do your job. Basically pulling the dirt and the grass away so I can get to this edge. For one, so we can bevel it down and round that sharp point. And for two, so I can get my spray to go over it a little bit. Now you can see we've got about a one inch trench along the side of the concrete which is going to allow us to get to it and bevel that edge a little bit with our grinder. As well as when we're done acid etching and we hit this with a power washer, it's going to clear this back a little bit so we can spray along the side as well with just our spray shields without getting too much on the grass. And again, if you can see that, a half inch, so minimal damage to the landscape. As you've seen in your manual, rounding the edges of the concrete is going to be our next step. So what we're going to do is take this angled grinder with the carborundum blade and we're going to knock this little lip off. Although this concrete was great, the guy who installed this concrete really knew what he was doing. He beveled these edges very well. There's still a little bit of a lip that we're going to knock off. The reason for rounding these edges is to reduce the chance of further chipping. If you've got a sharp point on your concrete, for instance, and a lawn crew comes across here and the mower hits that sharp point, it's going to chip. And when doing that, our product's going to chip with it. The homeowner never says, hey, my concrete's chipping. They always call you up and say, hey, your stuff's popping off. So what we want to do is make sure we round all the edges to reduce the chance of further chipping. And we do that with a 9-inch angle grinder and a carborundum blade.
Now that we're done rounding all the edges, it's time to V-open all the cracks. We do that with our four and a half inch angle grinder with the crack chasing wheel on it. Remember, when you guys are running the crack chasing wheel, you only want to drop it to about the side of the blade. Don't go any deeper than a half an inch. V them open just enough so when we acid it and power wash, it cleans all the debris out and we can inject the fast crack 1431. Our next step, acid etching and power washing. Um, first thing we want to do is mix up our muriatic acid and water. It's a four to one. That's right, four parts water, one part muriatic acid. Always put the water in the bucket first. And make sure you pay special note or attention to that because if you put the acid in the bucket first and then add water, the acid will leave the bucket and get on the person who's obviously mixing it up. So always, always put the water in the bucket first. Four gallons of water, one gallon of muriatic acid. All right, again, muriatic acid. You can buy this in most hardware stores or pool supply stores. As you can see, I'm wearing rubber boots, pouring the acid into the water. You do want to pay you know, close attention and have some safety precautions when doing this. It is acid. Um, there's gonna be some fumes that come out. It's not a really good idea to stand above the bucket. Stand off to the side with a good breeze like we've got going today. Pour your acid right into the water. Again, just remember when you're pouring the acid into the water, um, it is muriatic acid. Um, it can be harmful if it gets on you, so pay close attention. And just like I told you at school, everything here is just common sense. Use your head when you're out in the field and it'll keep you out of trouble. Remember, it's very important to make sure your power washer is going to start prior to you actually pouring your acid and water and spreading it out over the concrete. So hook up your power washer. Fire it up, make sure it's going to run, shut it back off, and then spread your acid and water so you know your equipment's going to start when it comes time because you do not want the acid and water to dry on the slab. And remember, the tip that you want to use when power washing is a turbo tip. Don't use a 25 degree tip or a zero degree tip. You always power wash with a turbo tip whenever possible. If there's wood joints in the expansion joints of the driveway, do not hit them with a turbo tip. That's when you're going to want to drop down to a 25 or a 40 degree tip to go over the wood joints. A turbo tip will ruin the wood joints that are in the driveway. Basically shreds them. So power wash the concrete with a turbo tip. Hit the wood joints with the 25 or 40 degree tip to clean them up. Fortunately for us, the driveway we're doing today has no wood joints. It's just got all tool joints and expansion joints in it. Good. Squeegees are far better than brooms when spreading your acid. Two reasons. One, it doesn't flick the acid up on the vegetation. For two, you've got more control when you get near edges with a rubber squeegee than you do with a broom. Let me give you some examples. When you've got the bristles of the broom, you're pushing into that wet acid, the bristles flick. And when doing so, they're going to flick the acid and water up. And it's going to land on the leaves and the vegetation and can create some brown spots. Again, so use the squeegee, spend a little bit of extra money, get yourself a good concrete squeegee, and it'll last you for years. Again, a good concrete squeegee is going to help you actually control that acid and water a lot better. It helps you get up along the edges, pull the acid back, it helps it roll over the edges of the concrete that we've already rounded and uh, just gives you better control of the chemical and water that you're putting down so you don't damage the vegetation. As you can see, after I spread the acid, I've got Ryan coming right in behind me and soaking the slab down to ensure that the acid and water doesn't dry on the concrete. Sometimes it does and you have to re-acid etch. If you can avoid it, keep the concrete wet while you're working with your acid and water. Once you put the acid on, you spread it out. Have somebody come behind you shortly after and keep the slab wet as you go. Yep, good. All right, we've got a little better than a half a bucket of acid and water left. 
The one thing you don't want to do is discharge this acid and water into the customer's lawn or into their hedges because it will kill the bushes, guys. What we want to do is take this leftover acid and water, spread it back out across the job. We've got 1,100 feet of concrete that we're doing here today, so I'm going to spread it back out across the job. That way when we power wash it off, it doesn't harm anything. Some of the vegetation that actually winds up growing through the job, grass, roots, and even old trees at times, growing through the expansion joints between the acid and the power washing that we're going to do will be removed. So don't worry too much about these on the front end. Um, your power washer along with that acid is going to kill them and remove them. All right, now that we've rounded the edges, we've beat open all the cracks, we've acid etched and power washed, it's time to do our crack repair system. Remember, just prior to crack repair, you should take your propane torch, torch open all your cracks to remove any moisture, and increase the temperature of the concrete so it helps accelerate the Fast Crack 1431. The cracks will dry out very quickly, removing all the excess moisture. When you open your Fast Crack 1431, you're going to notice there's three loose components in there. The first one is a static flow mixer. The second one is a backflow restrictor. You notice the backflow restrictor, if you set it down, it should have a little thumb grip to pick it up, and that's how you want to insert it into the tube. And a lock nut. How you put the Fast Crack together, take your two 300 milliliter tubes, put them in place. Pop your caps off. Place the back flow restrictor over the two spots, making sure one hole is on either side. At that point, you place the static mixer on top, push down firmly so it locks into place. And then the lock nut comes over the top tightens down and holds them all in place. You always want to take a test shot to make sure that the fast crack is thoroughly mixed. When it comes out the tubes purple, you know it's mixed correctly. If it comes out yellow or brown, it's not mixing, so stop what you're doing. Make sure that when you're shooting the fast crack out into the cracks, it's coming out a solid purple color. Now that the fast crack in the sands down into the V, we're going to travel it down tight. And then we're going to rake it flush. To maximize your coverage on your Fast Crack 1431, when you're done with the product, unscrew your lock nut, pop off the static mixer, make sure the two entryways are thoroughly clean, place your stoppers back in the orifice. Put your cover cap back on the top. Now, what's in the tip is already congealed. Can you clean these tips out immediately? Yes, but I'm going to tell everybody that's watching this video, don't waste your time trying to clean a $1.25 item. Throw this in the trash, have a new one for your next job that you pop on. It's not worth the time, the effort. Plus, if you don't clean it out correctly, you're not going to get proper mixing, which means you could have further problems on the job with your cracks in the future. So, throw the tips away, have a new one for the next time you do a job, and reuse what's left in the cartridges. 
Now that 15 minutes have passed since we put the fast crack down, we're going to go ahead and grind the surface. Remember, once you put the fast crack in, you should wait 15 to 20 minutes on a good hot day prior to grinding. Some days you might have to wait a little longer, but the overall average is about 15 to 20 minutes and it's ready to grind. If you notice here, there's a little spot where the fast crack when we were grinding, it left a little divot. Don't concern yourself so much with putting more fast crack and sand in those areas because when you put down your skim coat, you're going to fill and level off all these spots that are still a little pitted. So again, your skim coat's going to cover this. Don't worry about more fast crack and sand. Now that all of our prep work's done, the acid etching, the power washing, the grinding, the V&O, and the cracks, we're going to put our base coat down. Remember, your base coat accomplishes three different things. It creates your bond, first of all. Secondly, it creates the color of the grout lines that are going to be in your pattern. And third, it levels off all those spalled areas or the little divots that are in the job. Today, we're going to be skimming in white. One of the things you want to make sure you do is clean out all the joints before you skim coat. Your tool joints and your expansion joints and your tension relief cuts, make sure they're clean and free of all dirt and debris. So when you go through there with your skim and you turn your margin trawl sideways, you can drag that mix out nice and evenly. If there's sand and debris in there and you skim over the top, later on it's going to pop off and it's going to start the edges flaking and that's something you want to avoid. You want to make sure that before you skim coat, you take all vertical surfaces that meet the horizontal and border them with filament tape. I use three-quarter filament tape. We're going to put it up against the wall side where the slab and the wall meet. All the way down. So when we bring our trowel in here and skim coat, a little bit of mix shoots out from underneath the trowel. It'll get up on the filament tape, not on the walls. And when we're done, we pull it clean, and we've got a nice, even line. Anywhere borders or anything touch the concrete that you want to protect, you want to make sure you put your filament tape there as well so you can put paper on it and shield those areas off. Remember, mixing up your skim coat, your ratio starts at five and a half quarts. I say it in school and I can't preach this enough. Five and a half quarts is a starting point. It's not an exact science. So as you mix up your skim coat, start off with five and a half quarts, one cup of color. As your mix starts to get tighter, add a little more modifier to it to loosen it back up, guys. Guys, remember, one cup of color, five and a half quarts of modifier, and one bag of grout for your skim coat. Colorant, always make sure the lid's on tight and that you shake it up real well prior to mixing. Guys, remember, all the batch numbers on our liquid components, colorant, modifier, clear, the batch numbers are affixed to the lids or on top of the cans. The grout, the batch numbers are affixed to the bottom of the bag. Make sure you remove all the batch numbers on each job and affix them to the warranty sheet and follow the instructions on the warranty sheet in order for your warranties to be valid. Don't force your skim coat down. If it's too thick, don't wear yourselves out putting it down. Your skim coat should be nice, thin, and easy to apply. Remember, make sure your lids are tied on your colorant. Always shake your colorant up before mixing. You want to make sure that the pigments are, are completely suspended throughout the product. Yep, always make sure your lid's on the color. <laughs> so it's five and a half quarts of modifier, one cup of color, one bag of grout.
Guys, remember, five and a half quarts of modifier per five. In about 10 or 15 minutes of being in the sun, that mix is going to start to tighten up. It could get thick like mashed potatoes. It might be nah, more like a milkshake. The point of the matter is you're going to have to add more modifier to it. And the big question is, how much modifier do I add? I get phone calls. Ethan gets phone calls. How much modifier do we put back in our mix when it starts to get thick? That depends. It depends on how thick it is. You need to get something that denotes to you what five and a half quarts looks like. I tell everybody this at school. When I mix up the bucket, I look for about a five or six inch funnel that spins in the middle of the bucket. Some guys stick their drill down in it and pull it up and let it drip off. Other guys stick their finger in it and feel the consistency. Just get something that you can relate what five and a half quarts of modifier in that bucket looks like. For you northern guys that get quite a bit of spalling up there, we talked about this in class. I talked to you on the phone about it. Once you've acid etched and power washed, anything that's less than a quarter of an inch, our skim coat's going to cover. We've got a little bit of light spalling in here. Our grout coat or our base coat's going to cover that just fine. So don't worry too much about it if the driveway's just lightly spalled. What you want to figure in is about 25 cents more a square foot if the entire job spalled because it's going to eat up that much more material. <laughs> teach you to do to increase your speed on the job rather than trying to take your trowel and go down over the edge and get these edges you're going to get dirt and grass on your trowel and you're going to drag it back up on the job have one of your helpers take a bucket full of the mix or as you run mix over the edge lightly have them bring a paintbrush and come down the side and brush that mix on there go ahead All you want to do is get enough color on the side so it shows up in your grout lines. Get up near that top right there. If the concrete's too dry, your mix is going to tighten up very fast. Another thing you're going to want to do is to actually prime using a little bit of water out of a pump sprayer. When I say prime, we actually mean just tempering the slab, putting a light mist of water over the concrete to change the color. It slows down the absorption rate, it maximizes your coverage, and makes your skimming go a lot faster. Skim coating, when you guys go to skim coat, sit your trowels down, and where your calluses are, put it on top of the trowel, and turn it upright like a knife. Skimming is best done at about a 45 degree angle. You want to take your trowel, I'll actually go in, remember the tape we put up on the wall, it's to protect the wall which allows us to get in there and actually push some of our mix right up on it, ensuring we got nice and tight to the wall. Corners can be a little more difficult, I'll take the corner. Push it up in there, right dead in the corner. I use a margin trowel and actually scoop some of the mix up and then rake it back. starts to get too thick to spread nice and even. Remember earlier I said it should flow out nice and easy. Scoop it up and put it back in your bucket. All right, we need to temper this area down, guys, and pour some more mix.
All right, you guys see this tool joint that was in here? I've got a lot of mix down into it. You don't want to leave that mix in there until it gets hard. So as you're skim coating, take a margin trial and drag that mix back out. All right, now that the skim coat's down and it's dry, we need to re-detail the slab. We're actually going to flat scrape, rock mop, rub brick. We're going to take the rub brick and go along the edges of the driveway to actually get that extra lip that we put back on there with our skim coat down. And we're also going to place our saw cuts. We talk about placing saw cuts at school. There's no right or wrong time. You can place them before you skim coat or after you skim coat. It's a matter of choice. I choose to place them after I skim coat. I also put utility flags on either end of my crack repair so I know where the crack was so when I place my saw cut, I know where to lay my tape and make a nice straight line. Guys, rule of thumb when you're placing saw cuts is 25% of the slab. So if you've got a four inch pour, in most states you're gonna place a, a one inch cut. We're going in after the fact. The concrete's already broke and the weakest spot on that concrete is our actual crack repair. So we wanna make sure that when we place saw cuts, minimum two inches, two and a half inches is even better, but a minimum two inch saw cut. The next step is to re-detail the slab. This is where we take our handheld rub bricks, go around all the edges to make sure that our skim coat is nice and rounded following the curves. We're gonna flat scrape, rock mop, broom and blow the job down and get it ready to tape. Now that the slab's been redetailed, the joints have all been cleaned back out and it's been broomed and blown down and it's dust free, we're gonna lay out our pattern. We do that obviously with our filament tape. We're gonna use three quarter filament tape and we're gonna lay out a stone border on the outside of this job. We're gonna do a hand trowel system over that, let that dry, then we're gonna barricade that off or shield it up and spray our inside in sandstone. The technique that we're using with the tape is basically what we call a crinkled tape. It creates a jagged grout line. Um, very popular when doing stone trowel finishes or interior finishes when we're trying to make it look like marble or granite. What we're gonna do today is we're taping out that same technique using the filament tape for a stone border. What I've got Ryan doing is actually putting down two inch masking tape as a buffer to our filament tape. What it does, it creates a two inch zone for us to put our paper and tape on rather than trying to come in and follow that jagged edge, which is a real pain in the butt at times. This just makes it faster and easier for your shields. Now that our border has been taped off and shielded off with paper, 
we're going to mix up our chocolate mix and actually do a hook troweled system to create a stone texture for the outside edge of the driveway. A little more. Good. Pour a little bit over there. Ryan, I need a little more mix. Right here. Good. Keep going, Ryan. Just pour a little line all the way down. Good. We've done the stone trowel technique on the border. I'm not going to spend much time showing you how to do that technique because we already have a video in your package called Stone Trowel Finish on how to do this specific technique. I just wanted to make sure everybody understood the colors that we were going to put on. We're going to put on terracotta, sandstone, and forest green for the colorization in the borders. You guys can see how fast the stone trowel finish actually starts to look like stone just in between the steps. The last color being your lightest color, sandstone, really brings the tips or the tops of those stones out, making it look much deeper than it actually is. One of the most important things you want to do on a job is to protect the homeowner's property. We've got two rows of 36 inch paper going up across the front of the house to make sure that we don't get anything on it. A common phone call we get at CTI from a homeowner is that the guy sprayed something on their house or either got their lawn ornaments. As you can see, this sprinkler head is within one foot of where we're going to be spraying concrete. So we're actually going to wrap up the sprinkler head to protect it. You guys, I cannot stress enough, protect the homeowner's property. You got a happy homeowner, you're going to have a lot more referrals. You want to make sure when you're covering up the vegetation of the foliage that you don't use visqueen or solid plastic tarps. You want to make sure you use something that's breathable that protects the plant but still allows it to breathe. If you use solid plastics, you're going to wind up causing a greenhouse effect and burning the vegetation. It's time to mix up our main shoot or our main spray coat. Remember, for your main spray, it's five quarts of modifier, one cup of color, and one bag of grout.
When setting up your hopper gun, you want to make sure that you're shooting on the second hole up from the smallest when shooting your main spray. It gives you a nice tight texture. Another thing you want to be concerned with is the ball valve on the back. You want to start off when you start to spray with your ball valve at about the 730 position if you're thinking about a clock. It's going to give you the texture that you're looking for. Going a little more, Ryan. Hold on, Ryan. I'm going to take a test shot in that bucket. When you're spraying, it's best to do a circular pattern. It prevents getting lap lines. Also, your texture should only be about 60 to 70 percent coverage. Don't spray your jobs at 100 percent coverage. You're just wasting unnecessary material. When you're spraying over your saw cuts, treat them like they're not there. Don't try to avoid them, just spray like you would if they didn't exist. putting our second spray coat on over the top. You want to make sure that you're wearing golf cleats so you can walk back over the top of your product. They're very important. Don't use aerator spikes for the lawn. Make sure you use metal spiked golf shoes. See, we've got the hose stretched out across the job doing our second spray. You always want to make sure you've got somebody holding the hose so it doesn't drag through your mix. It's not that we're worried that the hose is going to actually mark the job. We're more worried that it's going to mar the job. So make sure you do not drag your hose on your job. Have adequate help. Guys, you always want to make sure that you go back through and respray or look at your jobs for hot spots. Grab some extra mix in the main color that you were spraying in and just even the job out. That's what we're doing here. We put our first spray down. Once it started to dry, we saw we had some hot spot areas. We loaded some more sandstone in and we're just evening it out. After your main spray, it's time to highlight. You always highlight with at least three colors minimum and highlight from light to dark. Today we're going to highlight with white, desert beige, and chocolate, and then go back to your main spray, whether it's sandstone, almond, whatever your main color is, highlight with that last. Guys, always remember when going from light to dark, take a test shot in your bucket. Make sure all the lighter colors pass through the gun and you're to your darker tone. Also, it lets you know that your gun's not clogged. Just remember, overspray can mess up your job. We finished applying our highlights. They're all dry now. We've removed the paper. Now it's time to pull the tape on the borders. Then we're going to flat scrape, broom the job off, blow all the debris off, and apply three coats of sealer. You want to make sure you go along the edges of your slab and detail them again. Use your flat scraper or your margin trawl to pull that excess mix that's gotten on the grass in between your spray shields off. You take the flat scraper, go down, and pry it back. So we're back down to the dirt right next to the job. Guys, you can see where the hand trialed stone actually filled in the tension relief cuts. I'm going to take the saw at this point and reopen all my tension relief cuts to make sure they're good and clean. By not doing this, it's going to crack and chip out later. So you want to make sure you reopen all your tension relief cuts and all your saw cuts in your job when you're done. Now that the job's been flat scraped, broomed, and blown down to remove any of the loose debris, it's time to apply our clear seal. We're going to put 150 clear seal on this job 
three coats. And we're going to do that with a phenolic core roller. We tape up the rollers and then remove the tape to remove any of the loose nap that's on it so we don't leave it on the job. When you're applying your clear seal, guys, a couple of things you want to make sure you're paying attention to. For one, you always want to roll in one direction. You don't want to roll like the arms of a spider in every which direction because it will show. Don't let your roller run out of material. Keep it fairly wet and I don't push down on the roller. Just let the weight of the roller spread the product. A few rolls and another dip. Apply it very liberally. Now you don't want to flood it on there to the point that you can't actually see the, the job you're doing, but a nice even coat. things you want to keep in mind when you're rolling on your sealer. First, keep your bucket fairly close to where you're rolling. You don't want to have to drip that sealer all the way across your job to start rolling. Second, don't roll your roller till it's out of material. Keep it good and wet. Third, always roll in the same direction because if you roll or cross roll or spider roll, you're going to see your roller marks. Just some helpful hints. Also, never back roll once the product's set up or started to dry for at least five minutes. If you go back five minutes later and try and touch up a spot, it's going to hair up or spider up on you. And you're going to get angel here that peels off your roller and it can even pull the nap off your roller. All right, here we are, the end of day two. We had two full days, a thousand square feet, a great crew, and shooting a video in the process, which takes a lot of time, guys, but we were done in two full days. It can be done. Apply yourselves, follow the rules, and follow the steps in this video, and you'll be done quick. Ain't nothing left to do but collect the check, baby. <laughs>